Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining. I'm JJ Walsh, based in Hiroshima, Japan, and this is Seeking Sustainability in Japan. Today, we are talking about the COP26 Glasgow conference that just happened with Leslie Mabon. Thank you so much for joining all the way from Scotland today. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm joining you from Oban on the west coast of Scotland, where miraculously it is not raining. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oban. I think I may have visited Oban years ago. Uh, really beautiful along the coast, right? Exactly. Along the coast. And anywhere you go in Japan, any department store, you'll find a little bit of Oban because we make whiskey. Oh, yeah. Whiskey is very popular in Japan and all over the world. Of course, Scotland and Japan are becoming quite famous for their whiskey, aren't they? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, Scotland has a bit of a head start of a few hundred years, but Japan is, is catching up very quickly. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about uh, the COP26 conference, which you were at in person. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into this studying and researching climate change? Okay. So um, at the moment, I, well, I, I work at the Open University in, in the, the UK, where I'm a, a lecturer, which in the UK, the same as an assistant professor, I'm a lecturer in environmental systems. And so that basically means I think a lot about people and the environment, how they relate with each other. I grew up in the north of Scotland, hence the, uh, the outrageous accent. And I, um, at school, I was always interested in geography. I was interested in the, the world around us and how we, we, we sort of link to, to nature. Growing up somewhere where you have a, a sea on one side in my village and uh, farmland and the other as I do you, you kind of think about these things and I went to, to university and studied there and I did a degree in geography and then again became more interested particularly in some of the the environmental issues that are less easy to resolve where there's not an easy solution and where we have maybe different concerns that different people have and from there I then started working on energy issues as a, as a researcher that was around the time of the Fukushima nuclear accident, 2011. Uh, my wife was just, and, you know, that, that made me think more differently about energy, climate change, and the environment in, in a Japanese context, which is uh, what led into the, um, the research pathway that I'm, I'm on today. Can you hear me? Yes, I okay. can hear you, yes. Okay, I, okay, wait. great. Sorry, I <laughs> muted myself for a second there. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your, when I was looking at your website, so your blog, um, you concentrate a lot of your research on the coastal areas. And you had papers about the Fukushima area, like you mentioned. Your husband, uh, your wife is from uh, Fukuoka. So you, you did have some interesting papers on urban like heat and mitigation and adaptation in Fukuoka, which was really interesting. How did you get interested in like studying the climate crisis in terms of the coastal areas? Because that seems to be a real focus of your work. Oh, absolutely. And part of that, again, is to do with, with where I grew up. So I grew up in a, in a small fishing village in the north of Scotland. And by the time I was kind of growing up, fishing was very much in decline or at least in transition. And we were moving away from having maybe small fishing boats that came in and out every day or did short trips to much bigger trawlers that were based a few ports along the coast. Nonetheless, I think maybe from an early age, that gave me a sense and an appreciation of how the, the, the sea and how the coastal landscape is socially and culturally significant and meaningful, as well as being a, a source of economic activity. And, you know, so naturally that, that gave me some kind of connection as well japan being obviously an island nation where fisheries and fishing is a big part again not just of the economy but of society and culture that kind of kind of gave me a way in interestingly enough and when i really started doing coastal issues in in, in japan it was 2012 and i'd been meeting a few different people that i was thinking about developing research collaborations with them. One of those was in Professor Midori Kawabe at uh, Tokyo University of Marine Science and, and Technology. And I went along and gave a lecture to her, her class on um, offshore marine energy in, in 
So Japan might learn from that. And she'd said to me after, you know, she said, are you, are you doing anything this, this Saturday? And I said, no. And she said, well, come back to the campus because we've got um, 15 fishers from Fukushima who are coming to um, talk to our scientists and learn about how the nuclear accident is, um, is affecting their fish stocks and what the, the prospects are for recovery. And so I, I, I had a bizarre but fascinating little event where they had a number of fishers from Fukushima in a, in a, in a room and they had plates of sushi and cans of beer. And while the, uh, while the fishers were drinking beer and all the scientists were drinking as well, they would sit down and they would chat. And so I, I said to Kawabe Sensei, I said, well, this is absolutely wonderful. This is an incredible way you have of, you know, breaking down some of the barriers between scientists and, and people who, who have kind of environmental concerns. And I'd love to study it more. And so on that basis, we got a proposal in and I got a, a fellowship from the Japan Foundation to, to do work on fisheries in, in Fukushima after the nuclear accident. And that was what really sort of kick-started the, the, the coastal aspect of, uh, of my research in, in Japan. From that there, is so, uh, so yeah. interesting. I, I read um, a bit of the article about Soma in Fukushima. Yes, yes. And you were uh -huh. talking about the social memory and getting resilience of the mm -hmm. coastal community back. And one of the key aspects was getting the fishing communities kind of back on their feet and, and getting the, the social culture and the social memory going. That was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it was one of the things that came across when we, so what we did is we went to Soma, this was end of 2019 before the pandemic. And we had fishers sitting in, in small groups with some of the extension officers from the, the prefectural government in Fukushima. And we were just asking the fishers to talk about well, what it was like kind of restarting and revitalizing fisheries. And this was something that they'd all said was, you know, understanding, trying to remember how it was like the past. And one of the things that we were really surprised by, and actually the, 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 the fisheries officers and the government hadn't appreciated before, was the, you know, the, the, the pride that the fishers had in being able to go out and fish in really bad weather. Which sounds weird, but the, the, the older fishers said, What we really regret, we have trial operations, but they only happen in good weather. And so we're not able to take the younger fishers, you know, in other words, our sons. And, you know, there's a gender aspect to that, but, you know, they said, you know, we, we can't take our sons out and teach them to fish in storms. You know, and then there's also the, the names of shrines, the, the location of shrines that, that links back to tsunamis and extreme events in the past. So the, the, that was one of the things that came across a lot was that social memory of dealing with extreme conditions and the extent to which that was or wasn't able to cope with the level of, of change that was brought about by the nuclear accident. Oh, really interesting. And it, it brings us on to the, the connections uh, that you saw as an observer at COP26. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, how did you get to be an observer in these these talks? That was really exciting. So I was that was very fortunate. So through the, the Open University, we were granted a number of observer passes, which essentially means that as an observer, you can go into the the space where the negotiations happen. And and you I mean you are very much an observer. You can't contribute to the negotiations or you can't comment on the, the, the texts. However, you can be there. Observers can attend side events. They can sit in on some of the negotiations and observers are, you know, of course, free to, to, to lobby in different countries for, for better or worse. So it was through the Open University as a, a research organization in the UK. We got a number of passes and I, I applied to, to do this. And um, then I, I, I was there for, I was there for the first week and what we did, which was, I think it was a, a nice idea, was we, we split the, the allocation so that more people could, could attend. So rather than having five of us for two weeks, we had 10 of us doing one week each. So as I say, you can't, you can't see everything. And one of the, the kind of ironies of, of COP, of all these negotiations, is that they have the big, you know, they have the big plenaries where people like Obama come and then you talk about things and they have the, um, 
you know, are these very high profile events. You have people like Leonardo DiCaprio flying in, heads of state. All of that to an extent is kind of a sideshow though. And the real negotiations are not the most exciting thing to watch. You know, they're very kind of straight laced. It's people sitting in big gray rooms going over bits of text. And the real horse trading, the real kind of negotiation tends to happen behind closed doors. It tends to happen in informal spaces. And if anybody's, anyone watching was was watching the live stream of the, the, the final hours of COP, you'll have seen, you have these big huddles, you know, and you have the different delegates, the different country representatives actually just huddling together informally to, to thrash out a deal. So as an observer, you can't see that. But what you can see is um, a lot of the, the different talks that are going on you can see some of the negotiations and you can see a lot of the the side events where different countries uh, show what they're doing and i can see you've, you've got up on the screen now my uh, my blog i was one of my my interests clearly was was thinking about what cop 26 means for for japan yeah really interesting and and in this uh blog post that you did uh, you were talking about as an observer the four or five key points um, that you noticed were about hydrogen and carbon dioxide capture as the most, one of the biggest aims. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, when I was there, one of the things I was, I was interested in doing was maybe trying to take, see what some of the key takeaways and key lessons for Japan were, given I have a, a research interest in, in Japan. So I, I was looking at what the Japanese government were saying, what they were presenting in their, their national pavilion, where they, where they were showing what they were doing. And something I think that came across very strongly is that Japan is pushing technology a lot as part of its response to climate change and is also pushing a lot the um, idea of a, of a hydrogen society so that, that you would use hydrogen as a, a fuel for transportation, for some forms of energy, for, for heat, for, for power and, th and things like that. Um, and also the idea of being able to capture some of the, the carbon dioxide emissions from power stations, from industrial sources, and then transport and store those in the, in the geology underground to keep them out of the, out of the atmosphere. So those are the, that was something that struck me quite a lot, is that Japan, certainly the outward facing, uh, the outward facing presentation of, of how Japan wants to respond to climate change puts a lot of emphasis on technology. And I should say this is actually something that there's been a quite a lot of criticism of Japan from um, particularly non-governmental organizations around electricity generation and around the, the phase out or the phase down, as we're supposed to say, of, um, of coal fired power. So there, there is an acknowledgement from the Japanese government that as a country, Japan relies very heavily on coal for electricity generation, which is is not ideal from a climate change point of view. What is being proposed is to, in the first instance, to kind of co-fire and mix the coal in with ammonia and with hydrogen and potentially capture some of those emissions. There's a lot of non-governmental organizations that are very skeptical of this. And the grounds being that this is a, a way of you know, kicking the can down the road of not having to address the problem in the short term and, you know, of, of, of perpetuating a, a society that relies quite, quite heavily on, on thermal power as opposed to, to investing in renewable sources. So that's, that's where the hydrogen and the carbon capture come into this bigger picture of you have a, a particularly an electricity network grid in Japan that relies a lot on coal. Nuclear is difficult for obvious reasons in Japan and capture hydrogen ammonia are, are being promoted quite heavily by the Japanese government as a way of, of moving away from a sole reliance on coal. Wow. I'm really surprised when when I read that um, because it's it's not proven technology. It's kind of a wish wish economics or wish wish sustainability. Um, we are not we're not putting into the main part of the plan things which are already proven to be working. Um, but one of the things you did mention, which I hadn't really read much about, is the carbon capture. 
um, that is happening in Japan. And you were saying that's one of the main parts of the plan is to do more of this carbon capture. Now, when you do carbon capture, I saw a little bit of the video um, from the company that's doing it. Don't you have to use a lot of energy to capture carbon? And then to store the carbon in the deep sea, you would have to use a lot of energy. Are they using coal for that? And then, then it kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, exactly it. That's, that's, a big, that's a big concern. And uh, engineers always get really grumpy at me when I, I put numbers out there, like, oh, don't, you don't put numbers on efficiency. But you know, it, it can be anything from 10 to 40% of the energy of the plant ends up then being used to, to capture and separate out the, the carbon dioxide. Um, one of the, yeah, Japan is quite unique actually in that Japan is one of the only countries in the world that has managed to successfully implement a full demonstration of a carbon capture and storage project that um, operates under the seabed in, up in Tomokoma in Hokkaido. Um, the UK has tried three times and every time they've given up. The US has tried many times and has given up every time. Australia has tried and keep failing to capture things, but Japan has, has managed to do this, albeit at a, a quite a small scale. So this is the um, their, their CCS demonstration project. The one caveat I will put on that though is, so uh, the, 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 the devil is in the, the word demonstration. So what we have in Tomokomai is a pretty small scale project that quite frankly, isn't going to put a dent in CO2 emissions. It's it's to demonstrate that the technology works and can be scaled up. The, the carbon dioxide that, that they use there comes from, you can see on that, that picture on the screen, they've got a big, um, there's a big refinery run by Idemitsu, and they, they capture some of the carbon dioxide from some of their refining processes and then inject it into the seabed where it's, um, it's remaining safely stored. But that's what is really complicated about carbon capture and storage is exactly as you say, we need energy to do the capturing and we then need to transport the CO2 somewhere. Um, in Japan, that will probably be by ship. And then, and this is where it gets really tricky for Japan, you have to store the carbon dioxide somewhere. So you need somewhere that is geologically suitable where you can inject carbon dioxide and where it will remain um, trapped in the atmosphere. The obvious question before um, anyone asks, how does that work in a country where you have lots of seismic activity? And um, the answer is that makes it quite difficult to find storage sites because there is the need to do all that surveying, all that extra monitoring to ensure that when you're putting CO2 in that it's not going to have any unintended seismic consequences. There were two earthquakes near the storage site, the, the Iburi earthquake in 2018, 2019, the two of them, which have been determined to be not due in any way to CO2 storage. But again, it does mean that for Japan, there are these, these extra issues that have to be taken into account. And then the big question is, can it be rolled out fast enough? to make a meaningful contribution to Japan's climate obligations. Uh, definitely important to consider the logistics, right? Like if that is the primary way you're gonna meet the 2030 and 2050 targets, how exactly is that gonna happen? And what, what energy do you need to make that happen? And how is it gonna happen after storage for the next 20 years or so, right? Like let's think about the full circle of yeah. things exactly i mean that's that's probably why co2 capture is probably not going to be used really for electricity we're more likely to see emissions being captured from industrial sources steel cement petrochemicals things where it's harder to you know it's a bit harder to find other ways to take the co2 out of it so it's more likely to be for these these kind of industrial applications rather than for um, the, the electricity sector. And right. really things are changing very fast. So whether it's even going to be needed or not, we, we don't know, but it's, it's, it's an, an important tool, I think, to have 
at one's disposal if we exclude the pun in case it's needed. <laughs> uh, let's go back to the actual cup conference uh you had some interesting tweets uh mm -hmm. i thought this one was interesting the last call for climate action the activists did mm -hmm. not represent japan in this lineup of world leaders mm -hmm. and uh what what do you think that the reasoning was you said maybe kishida prime minister kishida is too new or is japan not really seen as one of the big polluters? It's quite an interesting question. Yeah, I think it, it's an odd one. And what I found odd about it is, I mean, Japan clearly has this heavy reliance on coal domestically. Also has been traditionally a large supporter of coal power elsewhere in Asia, particularly in low to middle income countries through financing projects. And Japan's faced a lot of criticism, as I said, for, you know, for financing coal overseas as well as domestically. And yet, I, I feel Japan kind of flew under the radar a bit at COP26. You know, understandably, there's a lot of attention on China and on uh, the USA, also on um, the, the Gulf states and in Saudi Arabia. But, you know, I did, I did find that quite interesting and quite notable that, there wasn't in, in a lot of the kind of opposition, the, the NGO, the kind of protesting, there wasn't a lot strongly directed towards Japan. And I do I do wonder whether you know, so Kishida just won the election. I think he spent, if I understand correctly, he spent the grand total of eight hours in, in Scotland. He you know, he flew all the way from Japan, he came, he gave a little speech, he met Boris Johnson, he met Scott Morrison, um he met the, the Vietnamese president too, and then he went back to Tokyo. Um, so there, there wasn't a, a great deal of, of visibility. And I just, I just found that a bit surprising that given you know the, the, the size of the, the emissions that, that Japan is responsible for, that they, they kind of flew under the radar a little bit, I think, in terms of the, the international community. And I mean, I, when I say that, you know, I don't want to sell short the really good work that some of the NGOs like Kiko Network and E3G are doing to really put the pressure on the Japanese government in terms of their 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 coal reliance. You know, there's a lot of pressure going there. There's a lot of visibility for that. But from the, maybe from the international community from outside Japan, I was just a bit surprised that there maybe wasn't as much uh, as much pressure as we've maybe seen previously. We did though have um, a bunch of Pikachu. So we did have people dressed up in Pikachu costumes running down the side of the River Clyde to uh, to um, draw awareness to the amount of coal financing that Japan's involved in. That's a good way to to put Japan, yeah. Japan Japanese pop culture together mm. with uh, protest against uh, not making mm. your targets for climate change. I like that. Uh, you had an interesting post. You have a piece of coal. Yes. Um, that you, you, it's quite a beautiful piece of coal. Can you tell us about this a little bit? Absolutely. I brought my coal with me now. I have a, I have a lucky lump of coal here. Now, this is a, a blog of coal from, um, from Yubari up in, up in Hokkaido. And some people watching might know, some might not. Yubari was a um, very large, a very significant coal mining um, center in, in, in Japan. In the 60s, they provided a lot of the domestic coal that was used in Japan. The city had a population of about 120,000 people. Mines closed, not for climate reasons, but for various economic and then just energy change reasons. The mines had all closed by the early 1990s. And um, the result of that was that the population of Yubari dropped off sharply. And the city government had to assume liability for a lot of the infrastructure that had been built, schools, the hospitals, and indeed some of the kind of mining infrastructure. We've got fewer people, an aging population, a declining tax base. The result of this was that by about 2007, the city had effectively gone bankrupt. And the population of Yubari now is about 8,000 people. So down from a peak of well, into, well over 100,000 in the 60s down to, to 8,000 now. Wow. And so the first time I went to Yubari was, Yubari was in 2016. 
I was actually having a chat with uh, a collaborator that we, my wife and I work with there. I was talking to her yesterday morning, again, about, about, um, about coal and about the legacy it's left. And I think this is a, it's a really important lesson, not just for Japan, but for the whole world, that when we transition away from, from fossil fuels, you know, it leaves a social and cultural legacy. And that, you know, we really need to think about what it means for not just the people who work in these industries, but also the places that, you know, the, the places that are, are left behind. So, you know, as I say, this is my, uh, this is my, my lump of Yubari coal. And um, this was brought to me by our, our friend Manami Sato, who runs the, uh, the Shimizu Sawa project up in, up in Yubari. And this, you know, in my opinion, this is the only role that coal should have as a historic artifact in Japan's um, energy future. But it does raise these big questions about, well, what does a move away from fossil fuels mean for people that work in the sector, for the places that rely on high emitting industries, and how can we do what we would call a just transition? How can we, you know, in a fair and managed way, move away from carbon intensive activity for places and regions and, and workforces? Because what happened in Newbury was, in the first instance, at least anything but a fair and managed transition. Yeah. And one of the things you mention in your blog post as well is about um, one of the key points uh, that one of the nonprofits at the conference was saying is there's 10,000 people employed in electricity work in Japan. Now, that's not only coal, right? That's all electricity? That's that's right. I'm so glad you brought that figure up because I was, I was trying to fact check it before I came on. But this is a really super report. Again, the, the Kiko Network, who are probably the, the leading um, authority on energy and coal and climate change in Japan. They, they, they've done a wonderful piece of work on what transition means for, for Japan. And yeah, that's, that's right. You know, there's 10,000 workers in the electricity sector. And that is coal, that's gas, that's nuclear. Um, also worth seeing as well is that it's not just electricity that emits CO2. So I've got another prop with me here. So this is um, this is an ice hockey puck from uh, from Tomokomai, again, from just down the coast in Hokkaido. And um, this is a team that until last year were owned by the uh, OG Paper Company. So OG Paper, OG Seishi and Tomokomai make a lot of paper and pulp and basically provide about a, a, a very significant proportion of the employment in Tomokomai. Again, that's that's an activity that emits a lot of carbon dioxide. You know, making paper emits a lot of CO2. And you've got all these workers who are involved in a you know a high emitting activity. Along the coast at Muroran, unfortunately, I don't have a Muroran prop to hand, but uh, I do I do love my my high emission props from Hokkaido. But again, you've got steel works there. You've got thousands of people who work in steel. So it's maybe, yeah, I think it's an interesting one because it's perhaps not as visible in Japan as it is in a context like the US where, you know, we had Trump with the, putting his miners hat on and then going to the, the coal communities and Australia as well, where you had Scott Morrison passing a lump of coal around Parliament. It's visible, I think, in, in, in sort of everyday society. But you do have in Japan, you do have this workforce you do have these places that, you know, are heavily involved in economic activities that are not necessarily compatible with, with 1.5 degrees. And it's really important that we think about, well, what does this transition mean for these places and for these people? Because as I say, you know, we're talking tens, hundreds of thousands of workers. One, one kind of segue, which is connected, you were talking about paper, so it reminded me. Uh, one of the things you mentioned from the conference was an uh, area of Okayama called Maniwa, which yes. is, has a big forestry industry, and they're transitioning to biomass. And biomass is something I encountered in Kamikatsu in Tokushima as well. They had a long history of forestry in the area. They have too many of the same kind of sugi tree now, um, but there is no, no money to be made in forestry right now, but they're hoping to rebound the market and to use biomass as a more sustainable kind of industry to transition into. What do you think about that? That's, that's a really interesting one. The Maniwa case, I think, was very interesting. It was interesting for a couple of reasons. I'll come on to the, the biomass in a second. But first of all, 
it, I some I often think that in society we get we get too fixated on trying to learn lessons from big cities, from huge places, from exemplars of good practice. You know, so we we know about you know places like Tokyo that have climate plans, and then and then Yokohama who are developing plans as well. We tend to focus a lot on these big places. Sometimes really interesting stuff is happening a little bit off the map. And so I was really interested at the um, the Japan Pavilion that um, Maniwa in in Okayama Prefecture had been had come along, and they were this is a this is an area that's um, a, a, city, a municipality that relies a lot on forestry, and so this this leads on to the biomass. And so in Maniwa they are trying to think about well how do you bring forestry and how do you link forestry into I guess a, a circular economy? How do you then create products that are going to be reusable? How do you do things that are going to help support a sustainable society? And one of the things that's been happening there is thinking about how you use some of these forest byproducts for 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 an energy source and for, for a heat source. And biomass is in some ways it's quite controversial because the way it tends to be thought about in the UK is doing it on a very, very big scale with big power stations where the, the things that you burn, the things that come in, either have to be growing in in the global south, in, in less less well-off countries, and then that, that raises questions about, well, whose land is it growing on? What can't you do there instead? But doing that locally at a, at a, at a smaller scale is, is quite interesting. And again, what, what's interesting about the Maniwa case, now, what struck me was the mayor gave a presentation and he, um, he showed some statistics, and you know, they've got quite an old workforce in forestry there. A lot of, of people in their 50s and 60s. And so it raises that question of, well, how do you get new people into the sector? How do you get a younger workforce in? How do you kind of make something like forestry seem more attractive to younger generations at a time when the, maybe the, the sector's declining as a whole? I've seen other places, again, Tomakoma is somewhere where they're thinking about developing and, and growing um, stock for, for biomass as well. So it's another example of how you know these, these smaller scale and local solutions might be really important for a country like Japan, where you don't have a big abundant source of natural resources for energy. I, I was really curious about it as well. I encountered it at a, a very small town in Japan, uh, Kamikatsu, and they had started it years ago. Uh, the biomass uh, incinerator, I want to say, was shipped in from Europe, like very high quality. Uh, they were asked by the local forestry council to use the local wood that basically had no other use, but they had a lot of it as a local resource. So it's a really interesting argument because I, I often, like you said, I hear about the negative side of biomass in the states and and other places but it it seems like it might be worth like you, like you do for so many of your research projects you look at it from a very local point of view right how does it affect local people and local environment and and maybe not make sweeping judgments uh but like a case to case argument does that make sense i think i think it absolutely does i mean that's that's the thing with biomass is you know, there's no sense in chopping down 500 year old trees and burning them because you know these trees, these plants soak up carbon dioxide, and if you're you're just chopping them down, that's unless you're then capturing those emissions again, that's just going into the atmosphere. It, it becomes a zero sum game. But you know, again, doing that at a small scale, looking at the local context, and you know, there may be places where things like that are appropriate. That I think is one of the hardest things again, not just for Japan but for a lot of countries that. The, the, the way in which we're going to tackle and respond to climate change, there often isn't just one solution. You know, the, the, it might be that there isn't just one thing we can do and that we might have to do slightly different things in, in different places. And exactly as you say, it's until you go to places and until you sort of see what the local context is that you can't necessarily always know what is going to, what's going to work and where. But the key point is, and I think this will lead us into our whole conversation again, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. about transparency and clarity about how you're going to do it. And, and this seemed to be a common theme 
at the conference from the Japan side. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if I can say something a bit critical about Japan, having worked and done field work there for about 10 years or so, Japan is very good at demonstrating technologies. Japan is very good at um, demonstrating um, they can do things. So they've got this fabulous carbon capture and storage demonstrator in Hokkaido. There's a wonderful demonstration of how to make and use hydrogen in Namien and Fukushima. What I think Japan is perhaps not so good at, what the Japanese government isn't so good at, is saying, okay, we've proven this can work. Now let's you know upscale it at pace and let's try it in a lot of different areas. You see a lot of this, you know, you see a lot of these kind of one-off demonstrations. It's kind of like, yeah, tick the box, we've done that. Now we park it on the shelf and just leave it there. Whereas what you need to do is then think, okay, we've done one. How do we scale these out? And, um, and what do we do next? Just to kind of come back again and pick up on the, the, the coal thing, though. Um, one of the, 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 the real criticisms that the Japanese government has faced is that it hasn't set a concrete date or time frame for phasing out coal from the energy mix yet. So I keep seeing all these um, very sarcastic, shall we say, comments on Twitter, and I have to say they tend to come from the, the, the sort of right wing of the political spectrum that you know about Japan saying, oh, you know, if we if we if we shut down the coal power stations, then people will freeze in winter. You know, if we shut them down, then what's going to happen next summer when we can't power the air conditioning? And you kind of think, well, look nobody's saying we have to switch everything off overnight you know it's not going to be like 2011 where all the nuclear power stations were taken offline immediately what's been asked for is for the government to set a clear date by which they are going to remove coal from the energy electricity mix you know clear commitments to not build new coal power stations you know not clear commitments to stop financing any kind of coal overseas which which you know to be fair, they have made now. It's not about shutting everything down immediately, but it's about being clear and explicit about what the timeline is for that transition, what comes next, and, and what you you replace it with. And I, you know, I do, I respect and understand the arguments that Japan is a country that doesn't have a lot of natural resource, and that you know it can be hard, you know, especially given the sensitivities around nuclear power, it can be hard to imagine a pathway, but. What I will say from the Scottish perspective is it can be done. So, and it can be done much faster than you think. So I remember when I was, I finished my doctorate just after 2011. And at that time, we had a giant coal-fired power station in Scotland. We had a giant gas-fired power station. We had two nuclear power stations. And everybody was saying at that time, oh, you know, renewable energies, it's going to be part of our mix in Scotland, but it's never going to be reliable. It's never, we're never going to have enough of it for all the electricity we need. We've now got to a stage in Scotland where wind energy has developed so fast and it's been deployed so quickly that most days of the year we can meet most of our electricity needs from wind. If it's windy, and it's windy a lot in Scotland, we can make more electricity than we need, than we can use. So I suppose that would be my one message is, you know, sometimes you have to set these dates, you have to set these targets and then go from there and then the innovation can happen faster than you think. Great. That's a great point. And uh, that that's something that I, I was really encouraged by. Uh, my husband's from the UK. And uh, there was a lot of people uh, saying solar can never work in Japan. Wind energy can never work in Japan. And then when I visited the UK, and this is years ago, and you see a lot of people adopting solar energy and wind energy and we have a lot more sun and windy areas than they do you know so it 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 shows that once you set a target once you use existing technology that has been proven around the world to work um that might be a a good way to aim for right yeah yeah absolutely and again a lot of it is it's just how you generate electricity and how you make energy more widely and also how you then move it about. So I remember being told a few years ago, and this was kind of anecdotal, and I've never found, I don't have the numbers to back it up, but anecdotally I was told by someone who works for the Hokkaido government, in Hokkaido, they can actually make more wind energy than they need sometimes. Again, as I say, I don't have the, the figures to back this up, but I was told this, that they can actually make more wind 
electricity than they need. But the problem is just because of the way the grids are set up in Japan, they can't move it around Hokkaido, let alone around all of Japan. So, you know, there, there's these kind of challenges. The grid. As well. yeah. yeah, grid technology in Japan seems really crazy. Like each grid has its own its own system, like different, how do you say it, different kinds of generation types. Uh, I, I'll leave the technicals to you. Um, but wind was one of the key takeaways from the talks that you pointed out as well, that there is a plan to increase wind energy in Japan. Is that right? Yes. No, that's, that's, that's another thing. So wind energy in, in, in Japan is something I've been curious about for a, for a while. And it seems to slowly be moving in the right direction. I think my, from what I, I gleaned from talking to people, there are a couple of big barriers to doing wind energy at any kind of scale in Japan. One is the kind of wind. And again, I, you know, I'm not an engineer, but this is what I was, I was told. When you have typhoons, when you have maybe stronger wind, different kinds of wind, the kind that we have in, in, in Scotland and in Europe, it does pose some, some technical challenges. Also, as well, you have um, fissures. So you have um, anything that involves using the seabed means talking to and negotiating with fisheries cooperatives, you know, who understandably have got legitimate concerns about what this means for, you know, for their livelihoods, for their fish stocks. But it does mean that when you're doing new projects, there's this, there always has to be in Japan this extensive negotiation with the fisheries cooperatives, you know, who have you know, a lot of a lot of clout and a lot of power. But having said that, things are moving in the right direction. So Taiwan has really proven in East Asia that you can become a real leader in offshore wind. So if, what if you look at what's happening in Taiwan, it, it's really remarkable that you've got all these big wind farms on the the west coast of Taiwan. A lot of the, the, the kind of big multinational wind energy providers are getting interested. They've set their Asian hub offices up in Japan and in Taiwan, sorry. You know, and then there's this, it's really just taken off very quickly. And again, that's just happened to the matter. I remember a couple of years ago, somebody saying to me, oh, offshore wind's never going to be economically viable in Taiwan. But it's happened in Taiwan has shown it can be possible. I think we're starting to see that in Japan now as well. So, you know, I, I, I am... I saw at COP they were showcasing a, a, a floating offshore wind project that's been developed in uh, Goto on the islands and down in Nagasaki. And there are other, other possibilities as well. I'm, I'm Next week, I'm going to be getting up very early to join a public information meeting on floating offshore wind in Hokkaido and just to learn a bit about what that is. So you know, it's starting to happen. The technology is moving apace. Other places like Taiwan have shown that it can be done in Asia. You know, the global markets are realizing that, you know, there's potential for this in Asia. So, you know, I think hopefully that is something that could become a much bigger part of Japan's energy mix in the, in the very near future. Yeah, interesting. Uh, another point, different from energy, it, it could have big effects on meeting the, the carbon emission goals. Uh, one of the big points you said was technology and innovation which of course is connected to, to so much of about improving efficiency in Japan. Uh, that was interesting to see that as one of the main points. Yes, yeah, no, I, I did note that. So I was looking at a lot, a lot of the, the kind of the things that the Japanese government is presenting publicly and there tends to be very little in there I found about people. And there's a big focus, I think, on technical solutions. Now, if I had my cynical hat on, I would say that's maybe because these are things that you can then develop and you can then sell to other countries. You know, there's, there's maybe economic reasons for that. But there is that whole other side of how we respond to climate change as well, which is about some of the, the societal changes, changes in behaviours, changes in practices, changes in, in, in how we, in, what we think of as, as energy demand. So that, you know, that's the whole other side of the coin. And um, so I think there's just two things to be considered there. One is that you know, Japan does have this very long record of you know, developing technology and innovating things and then maybe taking leadership and things, maybe not so much recently, but certainly there is that, that history there. But there's also then how you, how you maybe link that up, how you link up the, the innovation of technology to also thinking about the people that are going to be using those those technologies and you know people's behaviors people's practices 
that's also part of the um, part of the puzzle as well that maybe doesn't get as much attention as it as it should in Japan. Well, you know, maybe I do things are maybe changing a bit, but perhaps so far that hasn't received so much attention. Yeah. Well, when bringing it back to uh, Tokushima, uh, not Tokushima, Fukushima <laughs> area, uh, I remember after um, the Tohoku disaster that they were talking about how technology can improve people's lives as they recover from the disaster. So for example, uh, Nissan was talking about their electric cars can be like a mobile battery. Now that might be the technology and innovation that could really help Japan is having home storage so you don't have so much reliance on the grid. Um, having more electric cars, which is better for the environment in terms of pollution, but also you could use it as a mobile battery, something like that. Um, so I think at certain times I do notice that conversation of technology connected to society. And so, yeah, that'll be interesting to see how that develops because it was one of the key points at the conference, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, it just makes me think as well about how you ensure that access to these technologies and these innovations are kind of happening equally across across Japan. Because, so I live in, um, where I live in Oban in Scotland, we're a very long way from anywhere, but about three and a half hours from the nearest big city by car. So an electric car is useless to me because we don't have charging points. If I'm going to drive anywhere, I'm driving far. And you know, we, we just don't have the, the infrastructure. And I think this is a, an issue for Japan as well, especially with things like hydrogen, fuel cell, charging stations. You know, okay, you've got a large urbanized population, but you also have quite a big population that maybe live in more remote rural areas now. So I, I talked to somebody from, from Panasonic about a, a demonstration that they were trying in, um, gosh, now, it's either Yamagata or Yamanashi Ken. Can't remember off the top of my head. Anyway, somewhere rural. And it was about this idea about how you produce that hydrogen locally, how you use it locally, how you do that in a, in a rural area. Of course, this leads into another big problem that you have in a lot of parts of Japan where you're in rural areas, you maybe have depopulation, aging populations. How do you ensure that you maintain a, a good standard of, of living for, for people that, that are, are still there? So as you'll see today, I've got my um, my Utet Skin t-shirt. Um, this is also from Yubari. And um, so Yubari is, like much of Hokkaido, is a place where a lot of rail services have been closed. Um, a lot of the rail network has been shut due to a perceived lack of demand and declines in population. You know, electric cars are great, but perhaps they're no substitute for good public transport. And so if you are going to bring in, you know, some of these, these innovations around transportation, there's a real need to make sure that there's fairness in the access to those that there is for rural areas, that there's access to those sort of places that are off the grid, and that we're not just rolling these technologies out in the richest and, and wealthiest parts of the country. Um, so as I say, you know, Japan is clearly a country that in many ways is quite urbanized, but also you do have a, you know, a not insignificant rural population and rural society where um, people have got maybe complex needs, complex demands, and it's absolutely vital that these the, the, these innovations are, are rolled out in a fair way and that you know, the things like electric cars don't come at the expense of public transportation and, and other sustainable ways of, of moving about and living. That's a really good point. And you often uh, see advertising by some of Japan's big car makers about the self-driving buses, which are picking up the slack for where public transportation has fallen away. Uh, there's no buses and trains anymore, but maybe self-driving bus might be. But it, you don't see it in action yet. Like this, this has been in the press or media um, it's one of those wishful things, perhaps, um, that hasn't really worked out in practice. Um, so you're absolutely right that you need to have, especially for graying populations, as people get older, driving is maybe not as safe as you get older on these country roads, right? Um, but having access to public transport, that's that's a big social value, right? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely as well. Absolutely, and um, 
access to the public transportation. Also, when you've got an aging population, you potentially have different energy needs. And again, I don't have the data and stats to hand, but when you have an aging population, things like heating in winter and cooling in summer become especially important. You're ensuring that that electricity is, is affordable um, and is also stable and, and, and reliable. When you have a, an aging population as well as transportation, these kind of factors come into it as well. And as I say, a lot of it comes back to, I think, you know, equity and, and, and justice and fairness. So it's one of the big problems, especially with hydrogen, is it's still really expensive. And there's a, a flagship development, at, uh, I think it's called Harumi Flag in Tokyo, in one of the uh, kind of areas of reclaimed land where they, they have this hydrogen district but, you know, it's high quality, high rise, you know, really flashy modern housing. And it's super expensive. And it's absolutely vital that all these aspects of how we respond to climate change are, you know, are cognizant of the fact that not everybody can afford that. And that, you know, we do it in a way that doesn't leave people behind. And as I say, it's a bit of a kind of hobby horse of mine, but these issues perhaps don't get as much attention explicitly in Japan as they maybe do in 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 in, in Europe and in, in the US and North America, or perhaps they, they, they look different. So just as, a, as, a, as an anecdote, a couple of years ago now, I was doing a, and we did a project in Fukuoka on vulnerability to, to heat waves, to, to extreme hot weather. And I was I was doing a, a shading session with a, a group of climate volunteers, a group of citizens, and I, I showed them. So in, in Scotland, we have maps of, um, we have maps of neighborhood income deprivation and also um, susceptibility to flooding and climate hazard. And the idea of making these maps, we do this in Scotland, is so that planners, governments can identify the places and people that are most likely to be at high risk and work out where you might need to target support or target policy and innovation so that everybody is, you know, it, it reduces the risk of, of poorer and less well-off areas being disproportionately affected by changes in the climate. So I showed this map and somebody kind of recoiled in horror. And, and she said, you know, that's really quite shocking to see. She said, you know, we, we wouldn't do that in Japan. She said, you know, clearly, you know, we have this kind of data, maybe in private local governments have it, but poverty, vulnerability, you know, are seen as a source of embarrassment. And it's not something we would maybe really talk about. Uh, my, my response was, yeah, there's, there's clearly a difference here. A review in Scotland would be that you have to talk about these things openly, you know, to, to be aware that it's a problem and you have to acknowledge that it's an issue in order to be able to then understand it and build the societal momentum to respond to it. But I think, you know, these these questions of, of, of fairness, justice and equity and how we respond to climate change, they're starting to creep in around the edges of the public discourse in Japan, perhaps not as explicit or maybe, they, you know, we need to think more about um, what they, they look like in, in a Japanese context. And I'm just going to put a little plug in at this point for a, a project that we're running at the moment um, through the British Academy, along with um, collaborators from Kyoto University, Professor Ben McClellan and Kyushu University and Dr. Andrew Chapman, which is looking at exactly all this stuff about a just transition in Japan. You know, what does it mean? What does it look like? What does this mean in a Japanese context? And these are some of the, the big questions we're going to be trying to explore over the, the next few months. Uh, looks really interesting. Um, you said the project will run over five months, will it? That's right. So we've got a, a very short time frame to do <laughs> quite a lot of work. And um, I sort of got the award letter and then we kind of went, yay, but also went, uh, because you know, we know we've got so much to do. Um, and so we're going to be looking at a kind of rapid review of what's happening in government policy, what are some of the NGOs saying, what are some of the local governments doing, and also trying to understand, like I said before, some of the kind of lived experience of energy transitions and what does that mean on the ground for the places like Yubari, the places like Muroran, the places like Kitakyushu, where there is that, you know, that big cultural, social and economic significance of high emitting activity. What does that transition mean for them? So this is this is what we're going to be looking at over the next few months. 
Yeah, looks really interesting and very important research to be doing. And it's a shame that you said before we started, um, it's unlikely that you'll be able to come in person and you'll have to rely on your Kyushu University and Kyoto University colleagues to do a lot of the legwork. Um, but hopefully you can still, as part of the collaboration, uh, be online and, and helping guide them and uh, work on the research that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the one of the unfortunate things is that for, for a piece of work like this, normally we'd actually want to come and talk to people and see things. I was saying this to one of my um, one of my PhD students yesterday that when you're doing social science research, often there's no substitute for actually just going somewhere and seeing what's happening. And you know, a lot of the connections that I've made over the years have actually just come through going to places and just actually seeing what's happening on the on the ground and yeah, unfortunately because of the, the pandemic and things you know, I'm, I'm neither a Japanese national nor a high value individual so you know, I, I can't uh, come at the moment um, one thing I will just maybe kind of pop in here as well because it's often an elephant in the room is about you know flying in emissions so I live on the, the west coast of Scotland and, and Japan is an, an, an awful long way away and you know there is quite a big carbon commitment to coming to do research and you know I, the one thing I, I try and do about that is reflect a bit on the value that I'm getting and that the, the society is getting from the work that's being done so I don't fly I never come for just one week if I'm coming to Japan I'm very lucky to have institutions and employers that let me come for a bit longer we try and link it as well to family visits so if I'm coming to do research I'll try and also see the in-laws do some things as well try and do things for a few projects at the same time so that if I am traveling that I'm not going back and forth but I try and do more while I'm there and at least, at least try and do more meaningful work do fewer visits but more meaningful visits with the, the, the emissions that are available so you know the pandemics made us think I think a lot about do we really need to travel but also actually about that there are some things that you know these, these more difficult aspects of family long-term you know long distance family relationships of them um, trying to maintain a research program at a distance that, that required us to, to kind of negotiate and make some of these trade-offs i think that's such an important question and i work a lot with the travel industry and uh, people always say well how can you have sustainable travel if you're including airplane travel it's not sustainable right but i i would argue very similar to what you said definitely don't travel for anywhere longer than a week like stay as long as you can make it as valuable as you can even if you're just a tourist you're not doing research i think travel is so important for future peace and mutual understanding in our world and how many times do i hear from visitors who have visited japan before and then there might be a disaster in japan and they feel so much more connected to the Japanese people because they visited or they understand the culture so much better. It's it's so important, I think, travel as a part of understanding differences in people and being more accepting. Um, so I think there are ways that we can do it better. Definitely don't go visit a new country for eight hours or you know, don't fly if you don't have to uh offset your carbon what do you think about that like buying trees or investing in seaweed planting projects and stuff if you're traveling i, I, I think there's there's also a lot about thinking about well who has the most responsibility and you know that we, we talk we talk about like for emissions and things we talk about the kind of martini glass effect you know the shape and it means that the very wealthiest people are the people that emit most and you know clearly people who can afford to travel to Japan for, for, for holidays, for leisure, will be quite high up that, that privilege list. Nonetheless, though, there are a lot of people who travel an awful lot. And this was something that was, you know, you look at the maybe pre-pandemic, I don't know about now, but you look at the, the busiest air routes in the world. And I think, and I don't know if it's still the case, but for a long time, Sapporo to Haneda in Tokyo was one of, if not the, busiest air routes and you know 
certainly pre-pandemic, you'd have a flight going about once every 10 minutes from Tokyo to Sapporo, and you'd have ANA and JAL planes almost flying at the same time on the same route. But, you know, that happens because there's a demand for it. And if you're in the boarding gate and you see all the salarymen in their suits and it's people on business trips, you know, that is a lot of emissions for short trips that probably don't need to be made by people in, you know, earning an awful lot of money. So again, maybe if there's, there's something that the pandemic has made us think about is how can business and things be done differently? And you know, even culturally, I know in Japan, there's maybe more of a, a culture around face-to-face -face business trips and meetings and trust building than we perhaps have in, in, in Scotland. But nonetheless, you know, it is that question about, well, who has the responsibility? Where does that responsibility lie? And that, you know, there are some people who are doing an awful lot of travel. Um, and I think, you know, that's it. Maybe the more travel one does, clearly the more responsibility one has to think about how that might be reduced. Definitely. That's very important points. And I think if Corona has taught us anything, it is how to use Zoom well. So oh, if yeah. it's just flying across somewhere to do a business meeting and flying back, maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe just a Zoom call will be just as good, if not better. <laughs> And yeah. you're not jet lagged. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leslie. That was wonderful talking to you about the COP conference, about your research. Um, if people are interested in finding out more about what you're doing, what's the best place to find you? So I'm on Twitter at LJ Maben. I also have a, a blog, um, resilientcoastal.zone. Um, if you Google me, my name is very unusual. There is only one of me in the world. So if you Google me, you will find me and you'll find contact details. If you're interested in reading any of our research, I mean, I know, unfortunately, a lot of it is behind paywalls because of the weird way in which academia works. But you know, if there's anything that's of interest to you, drop me an email and I will gladly share it with you. Um, so you know, I'm always happy to chat, always happy to, um, to hear input and, and suggestions, ideas from people. So please do get in touch. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd love to have you on again in the future because you have written so many interesting articles about environmentalism and sustainability in Japan. Uh, deep sea mining, we didn't even touch on that. That's a big issue in Japan. Uh, we talked a little bit about carbon capture, um, the social meaning in SOMA. Uh, so there's so many wonderful research projects you've done in Japan all the way from Scotland. So we really appreciate all the wonderful work you're doing. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Leslie. And thank you for inviting me on. And um, great to chat to you. Wonderful. See you everyone. Thanks for joining. Take care. <laughs>